Psalm chapter 26. Read the whole psalm. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, prove me. Try my reins in my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me, be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place. In the congregation will I bless the Lord. The psalm begins with the statement, Judge me. Judge me, O Lord. Here he is asking with confidence to be judged. God, judge me. We often fear and fret when the judgment of God is coming into our lives. But here, David says, judge me. He's confident. Judge me, God. Why is he confident? Because of his integrity. For I have walked in mine integrity. Integrity, upright. He has walked a principled life, an ordered life that, that is guided by the scriptures. Judge me, God. I have been upright. Therefore, because I'm walking in my integrity, Lord, judge me. The Bible says, I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Because he's trusting, he's not sliding. Because, because he's leaning on God, he's not going to backslide or fall away. He can confidently say, hey, judge me, God. Hey, that, I have faith. I believe you. That, this is the glue that keeps me from backsliding. Because I have walked in my integrity, because I am trusting you, Lord, I'm not going to backslide. I'm not going to slip. I'm not going to fall. I have a faithful walk, and I have strong confidence in you, God. I'm trusting you. You can judge me. Please do. Keep your finger in Psalm 26 and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. David here with such confidence, and we often backslide, and, and we often falter, and we often fail. How often do we just find ourselves walking in the Christian life with such confidence that we can say, Hey, God, examine me, Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and in verse 28, the Bible says, But let a man examine himself. The Apostle Paul, referring to the Lord's Supper and all what should take place, during it, he says, hey, let that man examine himself. So let him eat of that bread. Let a man examine himself. That self-examination is what he's charging. Verse 31 says, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And so, the reflection, that it's self-examination, judging of myself, ensures that I'm not judged of God. It ensures that I stand right with God. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. And so David, in his confident walk, in his post-self-examination, after his own judgment of him own self, he had completed. He says, God, judge me. In other words, he's inviting chastening of the Lord. He's inviting God to correct him. None of us is perfect. And so he says, God, I know that there's a blemish in me. I know that I have sinned. I know I've done wickedly. Judge me, God, that I should not be condemned with the world. He's asking for help here. He's asking for strength. And you can go back to that Psalm 28. He's asking for God to look him over. God to take his light of his word and to shine it upon him and see where he has air. Judge me, Lord. Is there anything I have done wrong against you? As a precaution, God, I feel I'm walking uprightly. Would you check me out, Lord? Would you see if there be any wicked way in me? Who's there today? 
Who's open before the Word of God? Who's, who's standing before God saying, God, I've walked in my integrity. I know your Word. I know what you want from me. I've done all of these things, God. Search me and know my heart today. See if there be any wicked way in me. Try me. Verse 2 there says, Examine me, O Lord. Think about an examination, a careful inspection, looking for every spot, every wrinkle, every blemish. Who's there today that they can stand before God and say, I, I am clean in my own integrity. I know that I have done right by thee. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Do you know what he's asking there? Try my reins and my heart. He's saying, God, check out what is leading me. Examine what is directing me, both inward and outward, because this is what the reins and the heart are, right? Reins is what goes around the, the beast in order to guide him whithersoever he will, right? It turns the head of the horse. It turns the head of the horse. He's like, Lord, try my reins. What on the outside what out in the world, what in my life is leading me and guiding me? Try those reins. Check out my life. What is leading me? Is it, is it my friends? Is it my family? Is it my job? Is it my, my, my money? Is it, is it something on the outside that is leading me in the path before me? What in the world is guiding me? What is the reins that are upon me? Try my reins. Next is the heart. Try my reins in my heart. My lust, my inner desires, God. What is leading me from the inside? What is guiding my steps? What is sending me to the next thing, the next idea, the next plan, the next, the next desire? God, try both the outward and what the world is doing to guide me. And try the inward and what my heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked is leading me to do. God, try those things. You know what he wants? He wants the word to be what leads him. He wants the entirety of his being, the outward, what he reads and hears, to be leading him according to the word. And he wants the word that is said in his heart to be doing the same. Try me, God. Search me. David here with confidence, with strong confidence, says, hey, the influence of the world and the influence of my heart, don't let it guide me, God. Help me. Lord, examine me. Lord, judge me. Lord, tell me, is there anything I can improve on? Is there anything that is leading me in the dangerous path? And anytime we do, let our hearts lead and we let the world lead. It's a dangerous path for a Christian to be on. And yet David here was confident enough to say, hey, I don't believe that I'm being led by the world. I don't believe I'm being led by mine own heart. Therefore, God, judge me. Examine me, and if it is the case, correct it. Verse 3 says, For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. David here reflects on himself, and he says, I don't think I'm being led by something of the world. I don't think I'm being led by my own heart. I think in mine integrity I have kept thy word, and I'm walking and trusting after you. But check me out, Lord. Examine me. And yet there was another if you go to Psalm 89, there was another time. God here is trusting in, or David here is trusting in God to, to judge appropriately and to lead him. David wants to walk strong in his truth. And he can trust in God. Why? Because if you read in Psalm 89 and verse 5, it gives you a great case for why you would trust in God. Psalm 89 verse 5 says, And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints, and to be had in reverence of them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is strong like unto thee, to thy faithfulness round about thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea, when thy waves thereof shall arise, thou stillest them. He's, thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with a strong arm. The heavens are thine. The earth is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. The north and the south, thou hast created them. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in thy name. Thou hast the mighty arm. Strong is thy hand. And high is thy right hand, justice and judgment, the habitation of thy throne, mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light 
of thy countenance. This is what David is trusting in. He's trusting in the God that has a mighty arm. He's trusting in the God that created the north and the south, formed the heavens, and they're his own. He's trusting in the God of justice and judgment with his habitation upon his own throne, high and lifted up. He's trusting on him to look down upon him and try him and judge him. It's bold to come before God and ask for this Lord to look upon you and see if there be any wicked way in you. This is how I want each and every one of us to walk before God with a clean heart, with a clean conscience, with a, with a, with a short list with God. We're constantly confessing and forsaking our sins. And when we do sin, we need to have that short list with God. Look at his loving kindness pictured in verse 28. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fall. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forevermore. Here God is promising it shall be established forever as the moon. That's his covenant. And as a faithful witness in heaven, see law. And you can see why it would be easy then for God to talk to David, for David to hear the words of God, David to conform his life to the words of God, and David to trust the Lord enough to come to him and say, God help me. And we need to have that same attitude. We think that God is that, that picture of the first part of that song where he's, he's big, he's bold, he's powerful, he's, he's commanding the winds, he's in control of his own creation, and we get so fearful that we don't come before him. And yet here David, if you go back to Psalm 26, comes to the Lord and says, Judge me, that same God. Examine me. Why? Because he had confidence in verse 3. The loving kindness was ever before David's eyes. And he has walked in his truth. Think about that. We need to have God's mercy before our eyes. We need to have God's grace before our eyes. And then whenever we sin and we look upon him, the first thing that we see when we turn our eyes upon Jesus is his loving kindness, is his mercy. We're walking in his truth and we're falling short. We say, God examine me, God judge me. And the way and the reason that we can go before him and even do that is because we have his mercy as the first thing, as the front lens before us. We need to be bold in the promises of God. We need to understand he's not lying to us. He's not trying to beat us down. He's not waiting for the time that he can just squash us as soon as we sin. No, God has loving kindness for us, and that ought to be the front lips of our eyes. I believe that's a very important thing, and the reason why David was able to have faith to trust that he has done whatever he can to please the Lord, and yet he knows that he has fallen short, and he says to God that he trusts because of his loving kindness. He says to him, God, would you examine me? God, would you judge me? Verse 4 begins to talk about the fellowship that David had. It said, I will, I have not set, we're, sorry, we're in Psalm 26, I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. So he's not sitting with vain or empty or shallow people. He's not sitting with those that are dissemblers. And what is a dissembler? That's somebody that has a disguise on. That's somebody that is shielded. That's somebody that is, is we would say, shady. That's a shady person. And David's saying, hey, God, as I try to walk in thy truth with a clean heart, as I want you to see if the world has any effect on me or pull, as I seek for you to judge me and look to you through that, that lens of your loving kindness and come to you, walking in your truth and seeking yet that I would grow even more in these things. Lord, know that I have not sat with vain persons. I will not go with dissemblers. I will not sit with vain and empty and shallow people, people that are shady, people that are fake, people that are phony, people that are of this world. A good principle is that who you befriend is who you will become. 
And so David here, he sets a clear distinction. Hey, I'm not going to be companying with these people, these type of vain and shallow people. I'm not going to company with people that are going to bring me down and teach me falsehoods and teach me errors and teach me wrong ways to live. I am going to not befriend them because I know, Lord, that who I become friends with is who I'll become. You know, water, they say, always finds its own level, right? So if you're a little bit higher and you're laying about and you're hanging about and you're doing about with people that are of this world, with people that are vain, with people that are dissemblers, you're eventually going to find your way to their level. It never happens that the Christian pulls the one up. You know who needs to pull the one up? The one that is fallen, the one that is a dissembler, the one that is shady, the one that is acting wickedly. God needs to pull them up. It's not our responsibility as Christians to do those things. We need to have a wall set up. And if you look, if, if you were to look it up, I heard a sermon recently from a, a friend, Pastor Johnson, and he, he talked about Christians being in a bad place. And the bad place was wrong friendships. And David here by principle says, hey, I'm not going around with these people that are wrong friends, wrong friendships, bad friendships that just want to drag me down. Verse 5, David further promises, I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. What would that be? That would be that would be the, the bars and restaurants. That would be the, the sporting events. That would be the concerts. That would be all these these haunts that the world hangs out with. David is promising, hey, I'm not going to these places. You notice that David here is is as God is beginning to examine him, he's looking into the, the lens of his loving kindness and he's recognizing that God is starting to perhaps poke some things, prod some things, starting to move in his life, shed some light on these things. And David further promises, hey Lord, I'm not going with these vain people. I'm not going with Decembers. I've even hated the congregation of evildoers. I'm not going to those places where I used to go. I'm not hanging out in those places that I used to hang out in. I'm not going around with those people that I used to befriend. They're just going to drag me down. I will not sit with the wicked, David promises. And it's that attitude and mentality that gives him the stance, the standpoint where he can say, Judge me, God. Examine me. I want to grow. I want to learn. James chapter 4, if you want to keep your finger in the Psalms. James chapter 4. James chapter 4 is after Hebrews, one of the last big books of the New Testament. James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Remember, David's just beginning to talk about the fact that, hey, I want to walk strong in the truth of God. I want to walk in his ways. I want to walk in his will so much more seeking after his precepts that as a precaution, I want God even to illuminate the things in my life. And he begins to say, hey, God, I'm not going to go with the dissemblers. I'm not going to go with the wicked. I'm not going to have fellowship with these shady individuals because I know what it says in James chapter 4, that Friendship of the world makes you an enemy of God. Why? Because the world wants nothing to do with God. The world is pushing against God. The world is the enemy of God. How can you go and be a friend of someone that is the Lord's enemy? You're an adulterer. You're an adulteress. I betrothed you to me, the Lord often says. He says it likens the relationship as a father and as a son. He also likens the relationship as a husband and to his spouse. And he said, you're running around on me. When you come to church, when you come to the congregation, when you come before me, when you read my word, when you seek after me, and then you go and you run around with the world all the rest of the time. You're double-minded, the Bible records in James and other places. It's unstable in all your ways when you're just sometimes with me and you're sometimes with the world. Verse 5 says, do you think that the scripture saith in vain? Do you think this is just pointless? Do you think there's, there's no reason why this would say, it's just an empty, it's just a filler in God's word. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain? The spirit that dwelt in us lusteth to envy? Do you know what happens when we envy? We desire something else. And when we're friends with the world, do you know what we lust and envy after? What the world has! And so we need to get ourselves into the mindset that, hey, if I'm going to love the world, I am by default the enemy of God. And if you're by default the enemy of God, do you think you're ever going to be able to stand before him and say, examine me, Lord, judge me, I'm an open book to you. 
He's going to pick out some things pretty quickly. The scripture does not, by extension of what that verse is, it does not say in vain, it says it with a purpose, that the spirit that is in you lusteth to envy. It desires to envy. Your flesh wants what it can't have. Naturally, what is being restricted from it. If you go to Psalm chapter 73, Psalm chapter 73, the Psalm chapter talks about a man named Asaph who experienced what it's like to have a spirit in him that lusteth to envy. The Bible says in Psalm 73 and verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. He knew enough to recognize that God is good to his own. God is blessing his people, especially those that have a clean heart. He knew the truth of the scriptures. Okay? Just as David is, is claiming, hey, I've walked in mine integrity. He knows what it means to walk in his integrity, Asaph is saying. God will be good to you if you walk in the integrity, if you walk with the precepts, if you walk with the standards and the judgments that God has set forward. But he was also wise to know that he wasn't doing that. Verse 2 says, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For why? For I was envious. Remember that spirit in him lusteth to envy? I was envious at the foolish. Who's that? The world? The, the one that he's committing adultery with? The one that he's making himself the enemy of God by befriending? I was envious at the foolish. I saw when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So he saw he saw their things. He saw their their gain. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. They're, they're not going through troubles, trials, struggles. Therefore, pride covers them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their heart could wish. Look at all the things that they have. He grew envious of these things when he, when he thought long about them, when he befriended the world. Verse 8, they are corrupt. And they speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people returneth hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out. And they say, how doth God know? Is there knowledge of the Most High? What is he saying here? He's saying that there is a wicked group of people that he's envying. These people have no fear of God. These people have nothing seemingly to worry about. They are full. They are proud, and they are able to be so. They're puffed up because they have so much. And he grew envious at them. Verse 13 says, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocency. He's like, doing this Christian thing is in vain. I'm doing the right thing, and surely it should be gaining me. Surely it should be allowing me to get more good. Surely I should be living a better life than these unbelievers. Because God is good to those that have a clean heart. What's going on here? For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. The Christian life is tough. I'm being plagued. I'm being chastened. God is correcting me. God is correcting my attitude. God is correcting my motives. God is constantly analyzing me and searching me. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the children of thy generation. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. He's in great mourning over the fact that he sees the world rejoicing in their wickedness. And he is at a loss and he's seemingly destroyed and plagued and chastened by the Lord as he seeks to do good. And it says in verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. You see what Asaph's problem was? He wasn't going to the sanctuary of God, was he? He wasn't, he wasn't congregating. He wasn't meeting with God's people. He was out there in the world. He was friends with the world. He was doing worldly things. He was just going about his life, probably the same type of life that he lived before he was saved, before he had believed on the Lord. He was going out and living a worldly life, and he started to lust and envy at it. You're an adulterer. You're an adulteress, the Bible records, about a man like Asaph. He was offended by the fact that the world has so much good and so much blessing, and he is seemingly destroyed every day. You know why he was destroyed? Because God is merciful and loves him, and God was trying to bring him back. And when he brought him back, where did he bring him to? The sanctuary of God. And when he came to the sanctuary of God, when he started to meet with God, with God's people congregating within that sanctuary, then he understood their end. 
Okay? Now it's brought into perspective. The world is going to puff themselves up. They are going to be proud. They are going to be full. They are going to seemingly have not a care in the world. But what is their end? What is the end of them that believe not the Lord Jesus Christ? Fire indignation which shall destroy the adversaries. And so here Asaph came to the point where he recognized, hey, I finally get it. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. It's a dream when one awakens. So, O oh Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. And if you're running around with the world today, you ought to get to this point where you come to the sanctuary of God, and suddenly you're mourning and you're pricked within your own reins that God has just tried, and God has just revealed what's been leading you. The world's been leading you. The world's been guiding you. The world's been showing you the path that you ought to go in. And what happened? Your heart soon followed. Your heart soon desired. Where your heart is, there will your self be all. There will you follow after. Where, where, wherever your world leads you, where your desires are pointed, that's where your heart is going to draw you. And you need to be pricked in that same heart. You need to be exposed in those same reins and come to the conclusion that Asaph did in verse 22. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Look, he looked through those lenses of God's grace. Thou hast holden me up by thy right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me into glory. Whom have I of heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart, and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. And we need to today recognize that if the world has a hold of you, you got to break that chain. you got to break that attachment. you got to remove your heart from you, and you need to draw near unto God. Draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you, the Bible says. See, our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? But the thing about our heart is we can make choices about where we direct it. We can either direct our heart unto the world and be drawn away in the lust thereof and fall into their same destruction and their same misery and their same reproach. The end that I'm revealing to you today, that the Bible's revealing unto you today, you can follow that with the fullness of your heart or you can trust in the Lord. Direct your steps in His ways. Let Him take hold of the reins. Let Him guide your heart. And so you can have the goodness you can have the clean heart, and you can say unto him, Judge me, O Lord, examine me. I don't know if many of us are here today where we can say, Hey, God, judge me. God, examine me as David did. God, um, I, I, I have hated this congregation of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. I don't want to be like a guy like Asaph. I don't want to be like I was in the past. I don't want that anymore. Verse 6 in Psalm chapter 26 says, I will wash mine hands in innocency. So David's saying, hey, I'm not going to run with those people in Psalm 26. He says, I'm not going to hang around with the world anymore. I'm not going to do those things that I used to do. I'm not going to let my reins be pulled by the world. I'm not going to let my heart follow after the lusts that it desires. But rather, verse 6, I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. David's saying the exact same thing that Asaph realized. Hey, I'm going to come before the altar. I'm going to come before you, Lord. I'm going to come to the altar and sacrifice. And what's the sacrifice that we give as Christians? Our own lives, our own selves. We give that to God to do as he will with it. The sacrifices of God are that broken and contrite spirit. And when we give that humility unto God, he does great things. And if we abase ourselves he will exalt us in due time the bible says and so david says hey i'm going to wash my hands i'm going to continue to behave cleanly i'm going to make sure that i'm not wronging you i'm not sinning against you oh lord and i will compass thine altar what is he saying hey i'm going to clean my hands but i'm going to come before your altar and and confess my sins anyways i'm going to continue to have that short list of errors that short list of faults before thee the psalmist there learned that we need first and foremost to congregate with righteous people. 
We need to be among believers. We need to not assemble with the world. Those that you used to run with, those that drink and chew and, and, and those, you know, hang around with the ones that too. You, you need to get rid of that, that fellowship. You need to get rid of that, that bond that you have. Whether it's because they're family or whether it's because they're of your own nation or whether it's because they're your kindred or whether it's because they're the same color as you or whether it's because whatever your bond is, right? We all get yoked up with people. I could very easily find myself hanging around with musicians because I used to hang around with musicians. I could easily find myself bumming around and chumming with people that are into sports because that's my past. That's, that's, that's what I used to do. That's what allured me. That's what I was bonded with in times past. My family, I could go. I could behave just as they were. But the Bible here in David is realizing we can't congregate with them anymore. We need to congregate with the righteous. Amen. Next, what we need is the washing of the water of the word. David says, I will wash mine hands with innocency, in innocency, I will make sure my hands are clean. The washing of the water is the word of God. And this is the water that will pour out over top of you as you read it. It will help you to be clean. Next thing that we need to do is we need to confess our sins. We need to go to that faithful and just judge. We need to stand before God after we have done all we can to get rid of the world's influence on us. After we have done all we can to get rid of our heart's influence on us. We need to stand before God and say, God, judge me, examine me. See if there be any other wicked way in me and help me in the paths of, our, of righteousness. Go before God to that faithful and just and fearful and terrible judge. And he will expose where you need to grow. And that is a good thing. Verse 7 says that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Are you, are you feeling like your witness is a little bit lacking these days? Are you feeling you're in a dry spell? You're, you're, not, you're not reaching people like you used to. Your, your, your testimony before others, your family, your friends, the world at large is just lacking. Perhaps it's because you're not congregating with the right people. Perhaps it's because you're not washing yourself clean with the water of the word. Perhaps it's because you're not confessing your sins and allowing the faithful and just judge to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to understand that our publishing with the voice of thanksgiving, our telling of the wonderful works of the Lord, whether we like it or not, is yoked up with our testimony before others. Lifestyle evangelism, there it is. Josh is preaching it. No, I'm preaching the fact that if your walk doesn't talk, then your talk don't mean a thing. And, that, and that's plain. We can go to a door as a complete stranger and tell somebody the way of salvation, and it'll probably work most of the time. If the power of God is in the Word, and we trust by faith that it's the power of the Word to do those things, okay. That's fine, and it will work most of the time. But you will have so much more power in your life with your family members, and with your friends, and with your kindred, and with your co-workers, if your life matches up. Because the thing about these people is, they're not strangers to you. They know if what you're saying is a lie. They know if what you're saying matches with what you're doing. And so it is so important that we have reigns that are set in the hand of God, a heart that is led by the Spirit of God. Because that's the best way to have a good and proper testimony, and that's the way to get power in your publishing with the voice of thanksgiving and in your telling of all the wonderful works of God. How, how, how uh, hypocritical is it to say, hey, God has the power to change your life. God has the power to take away your sins while you're smoking and drinking and cussing and hanging around with people in dark places, shady people, and doing all the things that the world does. It's hypocritical. But if you have the power of a changed life in your testimony, then you can go to people and say, hey, God will save you, and he may even change you. You're going through this struggle. You're going through this suffering. You need to get your soul cleansed. You need to be saved. And God can even afterwards take you and, and bring you to a cleansing, uh, a cleansing life, a clean life, a, a, a righteous life. You can, you can seek after the same thing that I have. Hey, I used to do all those things. God is able, if you'll let him, to carry you out of that mire to help you and to strengthen you. But if you don't have that testimony, it means nothing to the world. It means nothing to your family. It means nothing to your friends. It means nothing to your coworkers. Verse 8 says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. 
We need to love his house. We need to love where God's honor is. And we need to treat this place when we come here as the honorable place of our Lord. We need to come in here and we need to sit and settle in safely as an open book before God. We need to give ourselves wholly unto him when we, when we congregate together, when we meet together. We need to seek correction of God. We need to, when we sit down in the, in, in, the, in the pews and when we sit down and we open up our ears, we need to be ready for the preacher to say something from the word of God that stings, that burns, that hurts and then allow God to heal us afterwards. David says, I have loved the habitation of the... I've loved living in thine house, the place where your honor dwells. I just love it so much. And too often, as Asaph, we refuse to take part in this. We refuse to be committed to church. We refuse to be here and to be present and to wait for the preaching of God's word to impact you. Believe it or not, I don't stand up here and specifically think about your sins and your sins and your sins and your sins. Though I do know some things about you, quite often I stand up here and it's almost hindsight that I go, oh, you know what, that might be impacting somebody, but I say it anyways. Oh, that might be touching somebody in a specific way, but I say it anyways. But when I'm sitting up in my room at 4 in the morning and I'm writing a sermon, 99.9% .9 of the time I don't have a thought in the world about you or you or you or you or you or what you're going through. Okay, but God has a message prepared for me to deliver and its plain purpose is to just touch you, impact you, change you, change your desires, change your heart, grab your reins and move you in a different direction, give you a heart that desires something different, speak to you personally. And right now it may be happening and I have no clue about it, but that's the power of the word of God and that's what you're missing when you don't love dwelling in his house. So David recognized that this was important. He knew that it was safe. He knew that this was essentially the safety net which God places under him for when he goes and he lives and he does his life and he tries to live a clean life and, and tries to guide his reins and his hearts in the right direction. And he says before God, judge me, examine me. You know when David recognized that the judgment and the examination comes? When he goes to the house of God, when he dwells in it, the place where God's honor is, that's where God really works. That's where God really, by His Spirit in the assembly, in the congregation, moves in order to impact people the most significantly. And I can tell you time and time and time again, when sitting down there hearing the preaching of the Word of God, or standing up here preaching the Word of God, God has specifically answered questions that I've had throughout the week that I would not have gotten if I had just stayed home. I would not have gotten if I decided to go somewhere else. God has prepared a message just for you. And David recognizes this. He says, judge me, God. Examine me. I have loved thy habitation. He doesn't want to meet anywhere else. He's trying to avoid verse 9 and 10. He says, gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. He's like, God, don't lead me to be dwelling with these don't, don't leave me to be led about with vain persons, uh, going with dissemblers, the congregation of the evildoers. Don't gather my soul with them. Don't, don't leave my life with these bloody men. Their hands are full of wickedness. Bribery is in their very hands. God, I don't want to be stuck with these people. I want to grow. And David here is determined to grow. So you can see how he set up a wall of separation. He's seeking after God, and God is revealing unto him he's going to find him in the congregation of the righteous. And at the same time, he's decided, hey, I'm not going to run with the wicked. I'm not going to run with the evildoers. I'm not going to run with the world. There's mischief in their hands. He says in verse 11, but as for me, this is the decision time. He says, I will walk in my integrity. He's saying I've already been doing this. As much as in me is, I've been walking in my integrity. I've been seeking to guide my own reins and my heart to do what is right. I'm trusting in God. I'm also trusting in my own walk before thee. He says again and makes the decision final. As for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. He's saying, I'm going to walk in my integrity. I'm going to take the principles that you're teaching me, Lord, when I go to the house of God. I'm going to teach the principles. I'm going to take the principles that you've taught me when I've opened your book and allowed it to wash me clean. I'm going to take the principles that you've taught me. I'm going to allow myself to yield to them and to submit to them and to allow them to make me grow. I'm going to let the knowledge of God enter into me. I want you to know that, Lord. 
He's saying he's going to trust in God's redemption here. He says, redeem me, Lord. He says, God, whatever I have fallen short on, redeem me for. Do you know what that is? That's when you compensate. That's when God, God takes, hey, I only have this amount of my own righteousness and my works and my cleansing and my natural desire to just follow after integrity and follow after righteousness and follow after goodness. But God, you're so much higher than that. And God says, I will redeem you. I will give you what you are lacking. I will help you along the way. This is growth that comes to Christians. We need redemption, Christians. We often fall short of the glory of God, and we know this because all have done so. But when we fall short, trust in God to redeem you. You've been bought with a price, so God has saved you and filled you up to the fullness of perfection. So your soul is going to go to heaven when you die, but you can have that same faith and trust in him today when you can say, God, redeem me. I have fallen short. I have sinned. I have messed up so bad. God, would you redeem me? Would you, would you pay the extra? Would you compensate for the failures that I have made? Have mercy on me. Verse 12 says, My foot standeth in an even place. In the congregation will I bless the Lord. Asaph had the same realization. He said, I well nigh slipped. I almost fell to my own destruction. I was almost overcome by the desires of my heart. I sought after and loved after and lusted after the things of this world. But then I came to the congregation. And God's saying the same thing. David by his mouth, is, he's saying the same thing. God is saying through David, my foot standeth in an even place. I stand sure. I stand firm. When? In the congregation will I bless the Lord. David here is just exhibiting the fact that he knows where he can get his, his sure footedness. He knows where he can get his even place. He's just affirming to the, the thing that we all already know because you know, I've been there. I'm out of balance when I miss church. I'm out of balance when I don't congregate with God's people. I'm out of balance when I'm not fellowshipping with believers. I, I, I just become a mess. My life becomes just one lust after another lust after another lust until I don't know what. I was well nigh slipped. I start to, I start to envy the evildoers. I start to envy the wicked. There's no way at those times could I stand before God and ask him to judge me, ask him to examine me. Lord, reveal my heart, try my heart. There's no way that I could do those things. But if you have an even position, a standing within the congregation of the Lord, suddenly God is using the sermon. Suddenly God is using the fellowship. Suddenly God is using the encouragement, the, the exhortation, the, the assembly brings into our lives exactly what David experiences when he says, hey, I have walked in my integrity. I have been doing the right thing. Judge me, God, examine me. And we can all have that same thing. We need to get to a point where because we come together, we fellowship together, and we get all the benefits of that, we can stand before God throughout the week and just say, God, judge me. God, examine me. I, I, I've walked in that integrity. I'm, I'm clean. I feel I'm clean. God, show me the spot. Show me the blemish. And next time I go back to church for the week, I'm sure there will be tons of them, and I'll hear them again. But God, continue. 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 I love this habitation. I love this health. Gather me not with sinners. Gather me not with the wicked. Bring me into the house of thy people so that I can wash my hands. I can cleanse my wicked heart. I can have reins that point me in the right direction, and my heart won't be steered in any other direction but towards you this is what christians need to experience the same thing that david is singing about here and the same thing that asaph himself nearly fell and tripped upon don't be like asaph don't get to the point where you're just nigh unto slipping you know that the blessing of god is in the house of the lord but you're just about to slip you're just about to give up you're just about to quit that was asaph's testimony and finally he came back and said then i realized the end then I realize I don't want that. I want to come to God. I want to be with God's people. I want to be in the congregation. David here is singing out from a different position than Asaph. You can see it because David starts his song saying, hey, judge me, examine me. Why? Because David probably just left the house of the Lord, and now he's meditating upon the next time he'll go to the house of the Lord, and the next time he'll go to the house of the Lord. And every time he gets a little bit closer, he gets a little bit emboldened, he gets a little bit more strengthened in the truth that God gives him, and his foot will not slip as Asaph was about to do. His foot will stand in a sure place, in an even place. And where is that place? In the congregation. That's where he'll bless the Lord. Thank you.